Welcome back to The Real News Network. We're in Beirut with Professor Fawaz Trabulsi. He's a political activist and associate professor of political science and history at the Lebanese American University in Beirut and the American University in Beirut and author of A History of Modern Lebanon. So we're now in 1990, a decade more of struggle between Hezbollah and Israel. So take us through that. That decade is also rich in other events, which is the application of that new system, that new political system. Meaning the division of tripartite. A president, a prime minister, and a speaker of the house, but with all kind of presidential powers. Yeah, but with President Assad being the ultimate arbiter. President Assad of Syria. Syria, of those conflicts between the three very uneasy representative of the three main major uh, sects. And uh, are the Syri- is the Syrian army back in Beirut? Yeah, yeah of period? course. Of course. The Syrian army came back in 87 to end fighting for the control of Western Beirut by the Socialist Party of Walid Jumblat and Amal movement. So the Syrian army has a full comeback now and Israeli influence on the Lebanese center is very much reduced because the Israelis withdraw 83 from the mountain, they have to withdraw 85 from Sidon, and now they're back into where they started in 78, mainly in the border strip. That's one part of what's happening. Resistance is developing, but uh, on the other hand, actually the Syrian regime created a division of roles. Rafi al-Hariri, the newcomer prime minister, a billionaire, a family that controls some of the major banks. One major bank, but more, more importantly, an ally of the Saudi family, actually. A partner in Saudi Arabia of, at that time, Prince Fahad, who will become King Fahad. Now is assigned as prime minister, but with the role of what is called reconstruction. Okay, so it's economy in the hands of Rafi Hariri, fighting against Israel, Hezbollah. This is the main division of While the people of Lebanon on the whole are very poor, there's still a lot of money flowing through Beirut. Now a lot of money flows, a lot of money flows. Uh, Many immigrants come back because of uh, the high rates of the uh, interest for government bonds. You have uh, three or four years of massive uh, inflow of uh, of, uh, placement in government bonds, uh, Arab and international. But many, most of the investments are either in government boats or in real estate, uh, which is where you have the highest profits. And as you know, capital follows always. And what happens to the drug trade? The drug trade is progressively under control and uh, abolished uh, by agreement between the U.S. administration and Syria which was catastrophic in that sense, because by the time uh, war ended, you have, you have some 80,000 families living off drug production. Rather than follow the traditional method any country follows, which is we, we abolish sections of the drug production in return for help, for financial aid, uh, the Syrian government with the, with the American government decided to simply launch one major campaign and abolish all uh, drug production. So we had a huge problem, which led to a split inside Hezbollah because the uh, ex-secretary general of Hezbollah led a rebellion of the uh, disinherited uh, from the uh, drug trade, who were actually poor uh, farmers uh, who, who would make a few, three or four thousand dollars a year from, from producing their own uh, hashish, which is taken over where the billions are made in the later phases of the trade itself. Yeah, when the drug, drug hits uh, North America. America. You have an abrupt end of the uh, drug production and severe, severe problems in the northern part of the, of the Bika. The other feature of much of this period, which we haven't talked about, is emigration. What, 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 talk a bit about well, the effect of that. One thing one should know is that yani, uh, the, war, the war led to uh, yani some 800,000 Lebanese emigrating. Now many, many uh, would come back, 
but there is something in Lebanon which we call deep emigration. Many who had gone to Canada, Australia, New Zealand, the United States, were the ones who usually did not come back. Uh, but you have, in addition to emigration, Lebanese working abroad. The, the African emigration is closer. Here the European, m many of the European uh, emigration would come back. But very importantly is the emigration to work in the Arab Gulf and in Saudi Arabia. Now, physically, 40% of the Lebanese working force is employed outside. So you have, after the war, a real rentier economy in Lebanon, where most of the, uh, when Lebanon simply exports human beings and imports almost everything with marginalization, progressive marginalization of agriculture and industry and uh, uh, an exaggeration of the uh, scope and capacity of uh, the services uh, sector, especially the money sector. As I said, the banks are helped to recapitalize by the conscious decision of the cabinets of uh, Prime Minister Hariri to borrow money from the Lebanese uh, banks at very high uh, interest rates. So this has helped them assume the power that they now have over the whole uh, economy. And where is the government getting its revenues? They're taxing the money the Lebanese workers are sending back? As you could imagine, the Lebanese balance of trade is deficit, is in a huge deficit. It's a ratio of one to 10 one for exports, 10 for imports. Now the difference is, uh, is usually the result of the remittances of the, uh, uh, of the migrants, wh where you end up with uh, uh, a limping uh, balance of payments. But, but this is how money is leaving the country and this is how the debt is accumulating. So it's not only a budget definite, it's a national uh, debt aggravated by very ambitious reconstruction plans by Mr. Hariri, who had imagined that there is going to be a real Middle East peace and that Lebanon would have an international trade center for the whole region. Of course, you had tens of billions of pounds invested or, or simply stolen in that huge enterprise, which was called reconstruction. Even at 49% on government bonds, there has to be some idea there's government revenues. So what are the revenues? Is it, who, are they taxing the uh, remittances? Custom duties was one of the major sources of income for the government. And once Prime Minister Hariri decides that we join the WTO, those are reduced also drastically. Government uh, sources are mainly indirect taxes. We have a very strange taxing system under the uh, pretext of encouraging foreign investment uh, uh, income tax was lowered from 15 bulk income tax to 10 uh, income. But the majority of the tax income comes from indirect taxation in Lebanon. We don't, of course, have any progressive income tax. This is a value-added tax? The value-added tax was created in the later period, after 2000. After 2000. But no, the indirect by indirect taxes, I mean Taxes on fuel, taxes on cigarettes, taxes on bread, taxes on telephone communications. Economic expert, experts have proven how the taxing system uh, simply takes some $20 million from the poorer sections of the population, gives them to the uh, larger sections, the richer sections. It's a way of, of capturing the, the remittance income. The people send money back to their families, the yeah. families buy things, it gets taxed. Definitely. The government takes the money and pays it to the banks. <laughs> a lot of the money is simply swept from the market through high, high consumption habits that have developed, especially under the influence of uh, people working in the Gulf and taking the habits of conspicuous consumption. Okay, in the next segment of the interview, we'll jump to 2000 and the withdrawal of the Israeli forces. So please join us for the next segment of our interview with Fawaz Trabulsi.